Hello and welcome. I'm Fred Kate, Vice President for Research, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this most recent, in this case, our Earth Day uh, rendition of a series that we've been doing over the past six months, inviting our colleagues around the university and around the state to peer more closely into the grand challenges. And today, we're looking particularly at Prepared for Environmental Change and the Environmental Resilience Institute. As you may know, the um, Environmental Change Grand Challenge was the second Grand Challenge. It was launched in 2017 by a, a huge multidisciplinary team led by our friend and colleague, distinguished professor Ellen Ketterson. And um, what it responded to is the fact that we see so much environmental change, not just around the world and throughout the country, but right here in Indiana. We see you know, heavier spring flooding and longer, hotter, drier summers and growing um, growing uh, disease vectors, um, um, uh, insects and others that carry diseases. And it was an effort to help the communities throughout Indiana, to help individuals, to help governments, to help businesses respond to these environmental changes. In other words, even as we fight as a nation to try to reduce and, and ultimately slow them, maybe even reverse them, at the same time, for decades, we're going to have to deal with them here in Indiana. And the Environmental Resilience Institute and the entire team working on Grand Challenges is trying to help us do that. Janet McCabe is currently the executive director of the Grand Challenge, and you undoubtedly know that she's been nominated by the president to be deputy administrator of the EPA. But while she continues in that important role, I'll take this moment to say congratulations and thank you to her before we turn to our really amazing group of panelists today who will be talking about their research and also taking your questions as the hour goes on. So quickly, let me introduce them and then I'll give them a chance later if they, if they wanna say a bit more about themselves. They each have long and enviable resumes. Um, first, um, Aaron uh, Delot, who is an assistant professor in the O'Neill School of Public and Environmental Affairs, and he is director of the Metropolitan Governance and Management Transitions Laboratory. So he, as a social scientist whose research focuses on the roles that uh, public managers play in enhancing economic, environmental, and social sustainability. Uh, next, we'll hear from Gabe Filippelli. Gabe is Chancellor's Professor in the Department of Earth Sciences at IUPUI and a founding member and member of the steering committee of ERI. He's a biochemist focusing on the flow and cycling of elements and chemicals in the environment. I had the good fortune to actually go to Chicago with Gabe and hear him speak to a group of alumni who uh, you held spellbound there. And I look forward to the same uh, today. Now live up to that. Um, Next, we hear from um, Adam uh, Schubner. A Adam is Director of STEM Education Initiatives at the IU School of Education. And in this role, he cultivates partnerships that create transformative STEM uh, teaching and learning experiences and bridges research to practice um, opportunities to engage students in authentic STEM learning environments. Finally, we will hear from Betsy Sturrott, a friend of mine for many, many years, founding director of the Grunewald Gallery of Art, and who has curated many exhibitions, books, and, and catalogs addressing contemporary art, natural history, and the sciences. Herself, quite a distinguished artist, she was the curator or co-curator of an amazing exhibit, which if you didn't see here, I think you can still see at the State Museum in Indianapolis, the state of nature picturing Indiana's biodiversity. And then after each of them has had a chance to talk briefly, and we're gonna talk a little bit among ourselves, we'll have some Q&A taking your questions, which you can enter into the, into the chat or the Q&A. And Sarah Mincy, who is Associate Professor in the O'Neill School of Public and Environmental Affairs and Director of the Integrated Program in the Environment on the Bloomington campus, uh, will we'll manage those questions and make sure that they all get answered, whether live now or we'll get you written answers later if we don't get to them, because it's very important we respond to everyone. It is Earth Day, as I mentioned, and if you are looking for a way to celebrate Earth Day and you're uh, a little flummoxed about the fact that there was snow on the ground yesterday, so you're feeling a bit nervous about planting something today, one thing you might consider is going to the Environmental Resilience Institute homepage where you can actually make a donation to support the work that you're going to hear about today. This, uh, these donations are incredibly important, not only for the financial support that they offer, but because they demonstrate the broad support throughout the community for the important work that this grand challenge is doing. So before we go any further, I think it's now my responsibility to hand this over to more competent people than, uh, 
than me in this setting. And let's start first, if we can, with, with Aaron. And Aaron, the question to you and, and really to all of you today is to first tell us a little bit about your work and tell us why it matters to you. Like what, what motivates you to be doing this work? Great, thank you very much, Fred, uh, and for all of you in attendance today. Um, so I do study local governments, local governance, uh, and, and their sort of um, efforts to try and become more sustainable as organizations. Um, it's, you know, first off, I want to say it's, it's an honor to be here on yet another seemingly historic day in our country's sort of slow march toward carbon neutrality. Uh, and and I, I often get asked, why local governments? Why is that the unit of analysis that I'm um, fixated on? And when I listen to uh, sort of the speeches and statements that are coming out today from uh, national leaders about commitments of nations to climate action, it never ceases to amaze me how local governments are often overlooked in this uh, conflict, right? As many of us understand, local governments and local communities are the front lines for climate mitigation and adaptation. This is where uh, projects have to be implemented. Uh, it is where uh, innovations have to be adapted and replicated. Uh, and so preparing for environmental change is, in my mind, uh, the grandest challenge uh, that we confront as Hoosiers, Americans, researchers, human beings. And this challenge has to be met at the local level. So something that's important to keep in mind is that local governments are risk averse. And like all organizations, they primarily learn from experience, their own experiences, and through trying to replicate the successful experiences of others. This can be problematic because the causal structure of success is complicated and it's often ambiguous. What works in one community often does not generalize across cases. So this is where local governments most need our help, not just with developing or attracting financial capacity, but with data-driven tools and insights, with experiences, with expertise, which replicates. So this is where uh, entities like ERI come into play because they help local governments. Uh, they help them decide what kinds of expertise or insights are gonna replicate in their individual cases. And I would say you can today look across the state from Northwest Indiana to Richmond, to Gary, to Fishers, uh, to find cities, towns, and counties that are preparing to begin measuring their carbon emissions, uh, begin climate action planning, and uh, beginning this year to start actually implementing projects that are coming out of that climate action planning. So it's an exciting time to be here, and I look forward to the rest of the conversation. Great, thank you very much. And I have to say, it's one of the things in which I think ERI has been most active, if I'm not mistaken, is helping place interns in local communities so that they can help governments who care a great deal about this but may not have the, the bandwidth or the, or the knowledge to be taking on these issues. And so um, let me hand it over now to Gabe Filippelli. And Gabe, um, this, is a, this is a perfect segue because of course you also direct the Center on Urban Health. And so you think about these issues not just from an environmental perspective but a broader perspective and the floor is yours. That's right and thank you. And um, so uh, this is almost 2022, right? So I, I've been publishing papers and journals for about 30 years, and that's all well and good. I'm a scientist, and that's part of my job. But my passion with ERI and the other things I'm doing now is to get science out of journals and into communities. And so that drove, that's drove that been driven all of my uh, Grand Challenge efforts. So it's, it's, it's basically to promote public science. And, and I would argue you can do both. You can publish your paper in a journal and working with communities, you can actually have your scientific results provide agency for change in communities. And I've largely done this around environmental injustice. Um, they, I, I work a lot on, on disparities in air quality and, um, and water quality in cities particularly. But if uh, one of the things I've been doing the most on lately is actually disparities in soil uh, quality and particularly exposure of some communities to very harmful components in, in soil like the heavy metal lead, which disproportionately impacts low income communities of color. It's easily solvable, but we simply tolerate it. And so some of my passion is to build tools for communities to not only measure the lead in their environment for free, but to understand why it's there and to understand how to get rid of it. And I'm not saying that people have to take their own responsibility. In fact, some of our work related to what we've done with the Grand Challenge promoted an entire community to contact the EPA for a, a large scale community cleanup of lead in their environment, all led by, by citizen science. 
So that's my passion. And, and that's what I hope to chat about a little bit today. I also do a lot of work on climate science and climate communication. But the idea is, uh, is, to, is to no longer keep, keep the science in the, in the tower, in the ivory tower, but, but bring it to, to the people who need it uh, and, and bring it in such a way that it fights inequities and injustice. So thanks, it'd be fun to have this conversation this morning. So Gabe, let me just ask a quick follow-up question. I think we all have an intuitive sense, but since you said this, I just wonder if you would just take a minute and explain why is it that we see these issues uh, disproportionately affecting uh, minority and underserved communities? Well, this is uh, like very stark in cities. And frankly, um, it's if you just look at any redlining map, from uh, where you know where they uh, they dis disapprove loans from uh, from certain communities to try to uh, try to legally segregate uh, black communities uh, in the early part of the century. If you look at it now and you superimpose it on, let's say, a Google Earth map where you look down and you see what it looks like now, 60 years later, well, the the communities that were redlined uh, uh, are still largely without. They have tons of freeways almost no green area. Uh, they have a tremendous amount of legacy lead in them, for example. Um, and they are still largely disproportionately African-American and Latinx. Uh, and this is throughout cities all throughout the United States. So redlining has, has such a profound long-term impact, largely because of the way we value uh, real estate uh, and the way we place hard infrastructure is a little bit, it's difficult to move hard infrastructure like a freeway interchange. So. Fred, I think that's mainly why we why we still see this disparity. In fact, with lead poisoning, uh, the rates of lead poisoning for for black children is four times that of white children, uh, and, and and that that shouldn't be the case. All right, thank you very much, and, and what an extraordinary situation. Um, Adam, we turn to you next. Tell us a little about your work and what uh, what you uh, find exciting about it. Uh, good morning and happy Earth Day, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, I'm the PI of Educating for Environmental Change, which is a program that provides professional development and follow-up classrooms entry, middle, and high school science educators. Uh, we improve teacher practices and help teachers overcome barriers of misinformation and a lack of grade level appropriate resources to effectively teach climate change and environmental science. And the best part is that we provide teachers with direct access to IU climate scientists. Uh, our team is made up of IU faculty from the O'Neill School, uh, Departments of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences, Biology, Physics, as well as faculty from the Environmental Resilience Institute, the Center for Rural Engagement, and the School of Education. Uh, we're also partnered with the Wonder Lab Museum of Science, Health, and Technology, and local veteran science teachers. One goal of our program is to create a growing professional learning community of science educators who care deeply about climate science and how it is communicated. We love hearing about how our teachers are impacting their communities uh, through both teaching and advocacy. What makes our program unique is that we focus on issues that IU scientists are investigating daily. Uh, these include, but are not limited to, climate change, biodiversity loss, degradation of soil and water quality, changes in biogeochemical cycles, invasive species, and weather and natural disasters. Since 2017, we've worked with more than 150 teachers and impacted more than 20,000 students. And by working with teachers, our reach is multiplicative. Uh, for example, you know, if a program that works with 25 students will reach 25 students. Uh, instead, we work with teachers who educate numerous students each year, and that increases our reach greatly. Over the last two years, 100% of our participating teachers have increased their understanding of how the climate is changing, and 97% have increased their understanding of how humans are causing, causing climate change. Uh, and I'm very proud to say that in 2020, Educating for Environmental Change won the state's highest award for environmental education, the Governor's Award from the Indiana Department of Environmental Management. I don't get that off my mantle often, so I get to show it <laughs> off a bit. Um, but thank you very much for having me, and I look forward to the roundtable discussion. Super great, and congratulations to you and all of your colleagues on, on that award. Um, it was. Um, Big news when it was announced, and it's uh, nice to actually see the the the, the thing that memorializes it um, almost in person. So we turn to you, Betsy, and again, I think one of the things which I would be so grateful if you would uh, address is, I mean, you've played such a critical role here from the very start, serving on the original proposal committee. But some people still, I suspect, are saying, "What's an artist doing doing environmental change?" 
And so do you mind, uh, in addition to describing what you're doing, giving, giving us a sense of the answer to that question and, and why you're engaged? Yes, um, thank, Fred, thanks for having me uh, for this. This is an exciting um, way for me to talk about uh, my beginnings at ERI, um, but also to mention that um, it was Ellen Ketterson's um, uh, foresight, I think, to try to include the arts and humanities in the ERI and, and its, uh, its mission, because um, that's pretty unusual. Um, we all know that science and um, social science and these um, this research is very important for this uh, for the ERI but it was uh, pretty unusual I think to include um, uh, the arts and um, the humanities so um, that was a wonderful opportunity uh, to bring forth um, sort of ideas and thoughts and research about how to present contemporary art uh, about um, about climate change and about um, about nature, really. So uh, what, what I've been doing over the last few years is working um, with museums. And um, I might mention that everything that we do is very collaborative. Uh, I always work with scientists um, and I work with artists, obviously. Um, and I work with social scientists as well um, to create exhibits that have that, that bring across stories related to uh, the environment and to climate change. Um, so. As you can see behind me, this is a view of State of Nature, which um, is the exhibit that we uh, that Fred kindly came in and viewed during the pandemic, which was fabulous. Um, and uh, we are, you know, open to the public and everything else um, during the pandemic, which I, I'm very proud of. Um, but it's currently at the Indiana State Museum, and we have developed a wonderful partnership with them, uh, with their scientists and their um, art curators uh, to develop uh, this exhibit that contains um, artifacts uh, from Indiana's uh, prehistory and uh, along with uh, contemporary art pieces by all artists that have something to do with Indiana. So it's a very um, local exhibit, uh, local meaning the statewide, which I'm very, I'm very um, passionate about because I think sometimes um, um, our, uh, we, we pay attention to everything else except for what's actually at home. So I, I've been uh, doing a lot of work about um, the local through um, the CRE and um, our Center for uh, Rural Engagement and uh, some other things locally. So, so anyway, um, State of Nature was a great opportunity to present my ideas about, first of all, the local, Secondly, what kind of stories can the combination of artifacts and art tell us about Indiana's biodiversity and to create awareness to the public as they come in that they think, hey, I didn't know that we used to have um, mastodons here. Um, I didn't know that. Um, so it's really creating awareness is really what I want these things to do. It's not a hard hitting sell. It's not a, you know, a show about recycling. It's not any of that. It's about creating awareness. Well, and an amazing show. Let me say how much I enjoyed getting to see it and really how delighted I am that it's moved to the State Museum so that now a larger community in central Indiana will, ha will have access to it. Um, so one of the things that it seems like you were all talking about is, um, as Betsy put it, partnership. In other words, it's moving beyond whatever your field is to engage somebody else. And I will just say from the very start, you know, people were saying, are you crazy to do a grand challenge on environmental issues in Indiana, a state, you know, sometimes known for being, you know, somewhere between moderately and very conservative. And, you know, one of the things we found is that as we did focus groups around the state, everybody saw environmental change as a reality. It didn't matter who they voted for for president. It didn't matter which political party they identified with. They, they knew that they were, their fields were flooding in the, in the spring and they were parched in the summer and that it was getting harder, harder and harder to you know, generate power when it was needed and meet growing demand and manage runoff and all of these, all of these issues. So I'm interested. I mean, you each have a different way of engaging with the with the with the public and with these other communities. But at the same time, it feels like um, many people struggle with knowing what they can do. And I don't mean just individually, like what can I do in my own home, but what can I do as a business owner or what can I do as a government employee or what have you? And so do you find that a, a, a challenge? In other words, do you find that 
that you already are dealing with a population that's convinced you're right on the change part, the challenges on the what to do part, or are you still dealing with the, some people need um, a need to better understand the change part. And I, you know, I don't know where we start there, but Gabe, why not with you just because just you're smiling. <laughs> sure. Um, so I, I obviously work a lot with the choir. So these are organizations that uh, do environmental research and I mean, environmental uh, work like Keep Indianapolis Beautiful that Sarah knows right. quite well and, and Earth Charter Indiana. But I'll tell you, Fred one, Fred, one of my most, I think, productive partnerships developed from this grand challenge has been Citizens Utility Group. Right, Citizens runs our sewer and water system and, and actual natural gas system here in Indianapolis. And, and they're not a, a, an environmental company, that's not their, nor are they a fossil fuel company, right? So they're neither the, the, the classic hero nor villain in this story. They're just simply, you know, giving hopefully safe drinking water to, to our taps and, and keeping their environment, you know, safe within environmental regulations. But they specifically reached out to me in our program because they were getting a significant amount of bad PR for some of their mitigation, their stormwater mitigation efforts. So you, you mentioned a lot of spring rainfall that we're getting now. Yes, and what that spring rainfall is doing is triggering dangerous sewage that goes right into some of our waterways here. And so they're working very hard to counteract that. And some of those are what we call green infrastructure fixes in communities. Well, um, they thought that, well, if we just build it in these neighborhoods, they'll understand what it's for because we understand what it's for and they'll <laughs> love it, they'll embrace it. Well, they forgot the public engagement part that comes on the front end and public uh, input of, well, I mean, if they would have taken a small amount of effort, they would have had much less pain. So they started to engage with me because I'd already developed a lot of those community-based partnerships to make their life easier so that their stormwater mitigation efforts were ultimately more, uh, more successful and sustainable. And so, so it's probably not exactly what you were talking about, but they get climate change. They get the fact that they're gonna to have to engineer for, for a future that's a little bit different than now. And, and, and they just don't quite know how to get there yet because they're, they, they need us, I think. They need people who are thinking very strongly about these community connections to help them solve some of these problems. And Adam, let me ask you the same question in the context of educators and the educational System. I mean, I mean, again, are, are, do you find that you're you're having to deal with still persuading people there is an issue, or are you focused primarily on solutions? And, and do you find people embrace embrace those or are reluctant? I'm I'm just curious what you find the the feel is. Yeah, I'm glad you asked that question um, because I think I moved here in 2017 from New Jersey, and when I moved here, I expected that this was a very conservative state uh, that there wouldn't be support necessarily for teaching climate change. Right. Um, but the Yale Climate Survey tells us that 72% of Hoosiers uh, agree that schools should teach children about the causes, consequences, and potential solutions uh, to climate change. And piggybacking on what Gabe said er earlier, I, I think it's so important that we also recognize that these partnerships are two-way streets. Um, you know, when we started this program, we, we really expected that the teachers were going to benefit uh, from working with IU climate scientists. Uh, but what we didn't recognize at the time is that our scientists have benefited greatly from working with the, the K-12 teachers. Uh, when those scientists are thinking a little bit more about how their science is communicated to high school, middle school, and even elementary school teachers, um, I think that that's a win-win for, for both organizations. And Aaron, the same question, I guess, to you about local government. I mean, one of the things which I was delighted about when we launched the uh, uh, Environmental Grand Challenge was that we had mayors on board from day one. In fact, our opening video that we did to announce it included the mayor of Carmel, who was just terrific and, and again, totally convinced. But over the years, we've had more and more mayors become engaged. And is this, are, are mayors across the state, our city managers, our people who work in local government, increasingly aware that they need to do something about these issues, whether whatever they call them or, or however they identify them? Oh, I, I think that, that local government leaders, whether they're elected or appointed uh, administrators, understand the challenge and understand um, you know, what the future is likely to hold. Um, governments have been planning for a century. Local governments have done comprehensive planning since the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, that's a process of looking out into the future, trying to predict what's going to happen over the next 10, 20, 30 years and, and then prepare for it. And, um, you know, local governments have been um, 
attempting to be at the table in, in substantive climate action, uh, you know, dating back to, to Kyoto and before that. Um, it wasn't until sort of, you know, the Paris Climate Accord that local governments were actually um, at the table and involved in those negotiations. And you saw the backlash from that when the Trump administration pulled out of the Paris Climate Accords with hundreds of cities and local governments across the country uh, stepping up and saying they were going to try to on their own uh, uh, meet the requirements of, uh, of, of that, that agreement. So um, I don't think there's ever been um, uh, substantively, at least in, in, in my own research, belief that this is something that they can just avoid dealing with. I think um, what is changing now is that the traditional methods of planning, comprehensive planning, just trying to figure out where you're gonna build future roads and uh, that, that sort of infrastructure planning is now adapting. It's now, uh, it's now attempting to to accommodate things like green infrastructure, to accommodate things like social vulnerability. Uh, we're seeing communities that, have, that, that didn't have any interest at all or, or knowledge of at all how to, how to account for social vulnerabilities and look at, the, look at those vulnerabilities and engage with vulnerable communities now able to, thanks to data availability, thanks to the political cover, frankly, from getting outside institutions willing to come in and provide resources, uh, able to in, engage in a way that they haven't before. And, uh, you know, there are, there are uh, multiple communities across Indiana that have engaged in, in substantive uh, uh, engagement uh, uh, with, with, with vulnerable communities and attempting to try to, you know, to try to address these problems. And I, I, Betsy, I guess I would ask the same question to you. And I know you've been um, um, doing this amazing exhibit during a pandemic, which has probably limited the foot traffic you've had. But, yeah. but do people react um, positively? I mean, are we, are we speaking to the converted or are we in fact helping people, are we helping empower people? Well, I mean, I, th I think the important part about this um, exhibit, obviously if it's on campus, you're kind of speaking to the converted, um, sadly. Um, it still created, um, I think, a lot of questions by viewers uh, who did visit it in person. And yes, our numbers were down for sure. Um, but the benefit of it going to the State Museum is that it gets in front of a whole lot more people and those visitors and they've been open um, and they also have big sort of groups visiting and um, those are the people that I think are it's really beneficial to reach because um, the State Museum, you know, has a, is a very unusual, well, it's a typical state museum in, in that it, it, it carry, you know, it covers science, it covers art, it covers culture, it covers everything related to the state. So you're getting a real wide variety of people visiting. And I think that that's what's beneficial about having the show there because, you know, I mean, really typically art museums, you know, you have a specific kind of viewer um, that's going to visit that. On the other hand, what's been great is uh, having our exhibits online and also through uh, 3D imaging has really increased um, our visitorship and that has been our huge benefit. And so that's one benefit of the pandemic is that, you know, because we couldn't really be open all of the hours that we typically would, would have been, we were able to do that and start that program. And that's something that we'll continue to do for all of our exhibits. Um, so, I mean, the visitorship is, is enormous uh, when people go to those Matterport um, 3D scans, so. Right, such an important point. And also, I mean, let me just echo your point about the partnerships with the Indiana State Museum. Um, um, the, uh, you know, we have three grand challenges. This is our second exhibit to do with the State Museum related to a grand challenge. The first was on opioid addiction. And um, partly that reflects, I think, the value of people like Betsy and others that we can help bring to their uh, activities at the State Museum, but it also reflects that we pick grand challenges in areas that matter to the state. And so the State Museum wants to focus on those. And I, I think partnerships like this are valuable for us and, and for them. So another question which often is in my mind, and I am often asked about this, is, is there any hope? Um, you know, we had a Paris Accord. Um, feels like not very many people are meeting, the, not many countries are meeting their Paris Accord target. We, of course, pulled out of the Paris Accord uh, for um, uh, during the past administration. Um, is this something where, uh, I mean, I guess you could look at this as the glass is half full or the glass is half empty, that 
the confusion and consternation on the global level has driven more people to fo focus locally. And that would be maybe the glass is half full. And the, 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 the negative side being, um, is what we're doing on the local level going to make a difference in light of the confusion and consternation on the global level? And again, I'm interested in your perspective, not just as, 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 as scientists, but also as partners with the groups you work with. Is this an issue you're having to deal with? Is um, um, th this feeling of what can we really accomplish in the time of, of available to us? And again, Gabe, I might just start here with you because you deal with a lot of these people and are a scientist who therefore they may very well be asking you this question. You know, do you feel hope? Yeah, and, and thank you, and, and I do. Um, so I, I often feel the question when I talk about climate change of, well, what can I do as an individual? Right. And you know, there's this, this there's a standard act, uh, responses of, well, it's good to eat less meat because meat's very carbon uh, intensive. It's good to bike more and commute and use mass transit and fly less. All of that is good for you as an individual and also good for your carbon footprint. None of that is going to move the dial on climate change. Right. <laughs> The most important thing you as an individual can do is show up at the and vote for climate at the local, state, and national level. So, um, in, in this question of hope, you know, people talk about, oh, we only have 10 years to solve the problem. No, the earth is going to go on for far longer than 10 years, I'm pretty sure. Uh, as an earth scientist, I'm actually quite positive. Okay, are you are you willing to stand behind that? That's one takeaway message here. We got more than 10 years. So. <laughs> I will stand behind that. But the, the point that a lot of us climate scientists are, are making is that like, and I think COVID showed us this, right? We, we, we shut down the entire globe in a sense. So we shut down all of our personal contributions to, to the climate drivers. And how much did carbon emissions go down? About 7%, only 7% from shutting down a globe. So what that tells you is a lot of our carbon emissions are, are systemic. They're built into our systems that light up our houses, that, that, uh, that go into our vehicles and that produce our goods. So it's really, that's why the voting is important because voting ends up driving policy, which ends up driving action. And, and yeah, there is a lot of hope. I, you see this generation of youth, my goodness, they're, you know, I would just put them in front of us. Earth Charter Indiana does a really good job of that. Like you speak because no one's gonna look a child in the face and say, well, I don't really care that much about your future. Right. So, so yes, there's a lot of hope. Uh, obviously we, we have to kind of bound it by, I like a future less bad. I would like a future, you know, better than, than the worst case scenario. But you're right, when you started off, things are still gonna to continue to change. We're not gonna turn off the spigot tomorrow. And so a lot of what ERI does is mitigating some of those impacts. So, so let me invite any of the rest of you in on that question as well about, do you find uh, people either empowered by what they feel is failure at the national or international level to do more locally or flummoxed by what they perceive as failure at the national and international level. Any takers? I'll jump in. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I, am, I am hopeful for uh, sort of intergovernmental uh, uh, sort of responses. I'm usually more motivated by fear than hope though. Uh, so you know, I, I think that there are uh, some, some, some uh, great examples in the recent history of, of wasted opportunities for uh, the national government to provide more assistance to local governments. One example that my research has, has looked at sort of the, uh, the implementation and aftermath of the uh, Energy uh, Efficiency and Conservation Block Grant Program, which was funded through uh, the last Stimulus Act, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009. And that provided a tremendous impetus for local governments across the country to start taking substantive climate action. And then they turned the spigot off after, uh, after one, one uh, sort of round of grants. And uh, in reading sort of the responses from local governments, many, many responses, qualitative responses to survey uh, uh, data, you know, they said, imagine if you'd taken the community development block grant program which uh, was implemented in the 1970s, which has helped uh, local governments across the country uh, try to redevelop blighted areas. And you only gave that, those dollars to those governments uh, for one or two shots. You know, it takes a while for local governments to learn how to manage grants, how to, how to start implementing these projects. And uh, you know, if, if they had done that, that would have been a disaster because that's a highly successful grant program. Well. The EECBG was a similar learning experience for local governments, and we had a chance to 
to really turn that into a, you know, a, a ongoing uh, sort of initiative where the federal government through states uh, is, is providing um, all sorts of capacity for local governments to take uh, uh, more and more sort of climate uh, uh, action. And, and it didn't happen. So that's a learning example, right? That, that's something that local governments can learn from. And I think moving forward, if we see anything close to what the current administration has proposed for its infrastructure plan, they're gonna have to pass through similar grant programs like that. So that gives me hope uh, that, that uh, in, in the not too distant future, we are gonna see some sort of uh, rekindling or, or restart of some of these intergovernmental uh, grant programs. Okay, anyone else on this? Did I'd just like to say that, yes, my yeah. glass is half full as well. Um, okay, like, good. There you are, Adam. Like Aaron and Gabe, uh, I work with teachers and students, and I've seen firsthand how uh, climate science education has led to advocacy in the classroom. Uh, I really believe that uh, this next generation of students that's coming up now, and it's so interesting that today um, uh, we're having a conversation with, with four adults in the room, um, and really the, the conversation, though, about uh, advocacy is being led and initiated by students today. Uh, Greta Thunberg obviously being um, the, the person that we all think of, uh, but so many students have been inspired by her. And, uh, and, I think, and I see advocacy that's happening on levels that we've never seen before. And again, I think it comes from um, just good science education happening in the classroom first and advocacy coming from that. Great. So let me, we're, we're going to, I'm going to hand this over to Sarah and Sarah's going to field questions or she may have questions of her own. I suspect she's got all sorts of things she's been wanting to ask you. But just before doing that, I want to ask one last question. But if you've got questions and you're watching this, type them in to either the chat or the Q&A. We'll find them wherever you type them. I'm, I'm, I'm confident we'll, we'll, we'll get them that way. I think Q&A is probably the most reliable way because that way we can manage the questions. But I wanna just ask one last question and that is about the Grand Challenge Program and the creation of ERI. And um, obviously uh, the university spent a lot of money on this and you have spent a lot of time on it, but it's a, still a reasonable question. You know, What can we learn from this? Like what, is, what has been the biggest difference it's made in your own work or in addressing these issues that we've been talking about? Um, and by the way, you may also have suggestions for how we do it better when we do this again sometime in our lives. So uh, again, I, I, don't, I don't really know where to, to, to start here. Betsy, can we, can we start with you? Like what, what have we learned or, or, or what have we gained by doing this Prepared for Environmental Change Grand Challenge? Oh, I, um, from my perspective, being a, a little bit marginalized in the hearts and humanities, I guess, uh, um, it's the, it was the opportunity to work with so many amazing um, academics and scientists and policy makers and everything else that um, it, I wouldn't typically be able to do that. Um, so it was an amazing experience um, in that regard. Um, also, um, it, it affected the work that I do greatly because um, I thought about the collaborative nature of, of setting up something like ERI. Um, and um, I, I just think that uh, it, it impacted um, what the future exhibits um, I'm going to put together and projects. Um, it affects it on the, in the long term. Um, not to mention the the subject matter, uh, obviously, is something I'm very much interested in. So um, I think uh, I can't. I think all of setting up all of these. Grand challenges. It has it has to be a unique situation in all of them. There must be some huge learning curve. I think when you're talking about this many people involved in a project like this. Um, but I think the the way that it was handled, um, it's beautiful um, in terms of the the kinds of um, uh, press that that go out. The um, I don't know the toolkit. The you know I don't know. I'm just very impressed by it, and I I think that it's it's moving toward trying to accomplish what it set out to do. That's great. And it's, again, been an amazing team of people. Adam, how about you on this? Thank you. Um, I think the big thing is that working across the disciplines, working across schools and departments at, at Indiana University uh, really has expanded my role. 
my role initially was, was that of outreach, and it has moved into uh, policy and advocacy. And, uh, and I assume that for so many of the other scientists and, and people who are affiliated with Educating for Environmental Change, that their role has expanded as well. So it's really been a great opportunity, I think, for all the people that are part of it. Super. And Aaron? Yeah, I would just second what Adam said. I think I'm I'm the newest to Indiana. I think on this on this panel, this is only my second year at IU. But uh, ERI has helped open doors uh, both with communities uh, to try to get in and, and uh, establish some uh, some relationships with with local governments that I hope to be studying over the the, the coming years. Uh, but they've also connected me with other uh, you know hydrologists, climate scientists to develop interdisciplinary NSF grant proposals. To study, you know, nitrogen loading uh, in the Wabash River Basin and all sorts of other things that has a, you know, has a public management scholar is a little bit out of my wheelhouse, right? Okay. So, um, so that's been a tremendous benefit from ERI. Super, and we are delighted you are here. And Gabe, I'll give you the last word on this uh, on this topic. Well, thanks. And you know what I think it's done well? It's, it's done what it should do, which is it supports a tremendous amount of science, new science that is applied to Indiana and the Midwest and, and, and beyond. You can extrapolate that, right? So the fundamental science and trying to understand what are the changes going on. But you know what's truly unique about this grand challenge is you have small communities, cities and, and, and towns around Indiana who look to IU now for resources on developing their own climate resilience. I mean, we are now a state level resource uh, for communities to build some of this adaptation and, and, uh, and support a lot of our, our programs that, that seek to, for example, to uh, build um, uh, climate ass uh, carbon assessments for small, uh, small towns and cities from around the state. Uh, as well as many others. So that's what has been really unique about this grant challenge. And you can't do that with just a normal NSF research grant, let's say, <laughs> this kind of effort. Right. All right, super, thank you. So Sarah, I'm gonna hand it over to you now and if uh, you'll handle the questions and I'll say a final word at the end. So thank you so much. Great, thank you, Fred. I'm really honored to be a part of this and speaking with my colleagues um, here today. Gabe, um, what you were just talking about is, is somewhat related to a question that came through. That's a very specific question, but it reminds me of a bigger topic. The specific question is, I, I'm assuming this individual is in Indianapolis. He's suggesting that there seems to be a reduction in recycling bins around town. And he's wondering if there's a website where you can find you know, the locations of recycling bins in the community. And I don't know that anybody here might be able to answer that specific question, but it reminds me of, of all of the resources that ERI has been developing um, for, for the state, for, for, for communities across the state. And I wonder if you or someone else might speak to that a bit. Um, how can, you know, when, when citizens are trying to find information like that, what kinds of information, what kinds of data uh, sources has ERI created that are publicly accessible? Well, there's, of, of course, our tool toolbox, our dashboard, the ERIT program, which is maybe you can elaborate. You, I think you know more about it than I do, Sarah, but an incredible resource uh, for people around this around the state. Um, and it's it's likely uh, it's so successful that I think we're going to be able to export it to other states uh, soon, that model. Uh, and and so that's a great example. Right. In terms of the details. Uh, yes, the recycling thing is a real issue that that person brought up. Um, uh, COVID has reduced the rate of recycling. It's also nobody wants our recycling anymore. So the recycling is going to be a big challenge. And, and I know a lot of, um, a lot of young people uh, uh, really want to go into that area. And I would say I would love to have, uh, have ERI sponsor some uh, youth recycling champions uh, because we need to do this a little bit better. But yeah, I, I think that um, ERIT is a phenomenal resource uh, for, for Hoosiers. And that's something that's uniquely built and supported by ERI. Great. Yeah, that was that was one of the ones I was thinking of. And I think there are more on the way um, in terms of data sources for the public. Um, so another question came in uh, about social media uh, and, and concern that it is taking up more and more human attention, leading to increased ignorance and lack of emotional connection to natural systems that support life. How might ERI address this problem? And I wonder if I could direct that to Adam. I, you know, Adam, I think of social media as being much more of a phenomenon of, uh, among young people. 
So maybe you could speak to that. Right. I, I don't know if I'm the expert on social media, but I can talk a little bit about misinformation in science education. And, um, and I think that, you know, in, in 2015, the Heartland Institute uh, mailed out uh, a book to teachers all across the United States, uh, science teachers, 350,000 of them that was titled, Why Scientists Disagree About Global Warming. And I'm sure that that book has been turned into social media as well, um, that, that a lot of the uh, misinformation that's in that book has been uh, spread about through um, uh, through Facebook and, and other social media outlets. Uh, one of the most important things is how do we how do we combat uh, this skepticism and denial? How do we combat this with positive information with the, with the correct information? And that's really the trick, right? Because skepticism and denial are rooted in people's identities, whether it's political identities or religious identities. And trying to get people to understand uh, climate change or why they should care about climate change is not just a matter of, let me throw more evidence at you. Um, so what we have to do is we have to not only um, communicate the science well, but we also have to communicate it through narratives that change people's minds. So hearing the story of a, uh, a farmer in Indiana who has lived through 300 year floods in the last 15 years and how that person who didn't believe in climate change now has a 20% crop reduction and understands that this is due to climate change. Those are the stories that have to be told with the science uh, if we're going to be overcoming um, some of that misinformation that's out there. And I I'm sorry for not addressing more about social media, but uh, social media really isn't uh, as big of a concern in the classroom uh, as uh, although I'm sure that students are getting a lot of misinformation from the social media there as well. Does anyone else want to speak to that that might feel like it's more in your wheelhouse? I'd like to speak to it a little bit. Um, I do think that um, people pay attention to social media a lot. And I think that's a, a resource that <laughs> we should all be using. <laughs> Unfortunately, um, you know, to, I, I hate to jump on the bandwagon with with all the young people and make TikTok videos and everything else. But um, that is a way to reach people. And I think the sad part um, in this question is that people pay much more attention to that stuff than they do to their and surroundings around them outside. So um, create, you know, I guess trying to connect that social media and connect that emotional intelligence and emotional connection to the to the real world is is our challenge. Um, and um, that's telling those stories as Adam was talking about. Um, that's exactly something that I think has to happen. And I think exhibits are one way to do that. Um, you know, again, it's one way. Um, so there are many ways that those stories have to be told. Great. I think um, that, go ahead. I was gonna jump into it just to just, a, just a, a third, I guess, uh, uh, what, what Adam and Betsy just said. I mean, there is a lot of research in, in the um, sort of political psychology um, that looks at um, how social media is used to spread messages. And, um, you know, even though social media has been very effective at creating filter bubbles that are difficult for, uh, um, difficult to break through sometimes, emotional messages do carry and do metastasize through social media much more quickly than sort of than, than, than numeric, you know, based information. Uh, so, um, so using you know, sort of uh, positive valence or negative valence uh, uh, sort of information in the form of narratives uh, is, is, is perhaps a good way to try to, to, to deal with uh, filter bubbles. Great. Um, Tyler asks, um, how can he get involved in citizen science or other programs in his communities? community? He's very passionate about these issues surrounding climate and environmental health, but doesn't have any practical experience or knowledge in the science behind the issues, and he'd like to. So I wonder if someone, one of you could speak to that. Gabe, you've done so much with citizen science. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, there's there's a lot of opportunities. Uh, you know, the original citizen scientists are the birders. You know, and and uh, Ellen Ketterson, the champion who started this whole effort, uh, she knows quite well uh, that there's a very strong uh, group of people who've been. Uh, they apparently they love birds. I don't know why, but they keep track of them and they mark down when they see them and and so forth. But uh, citizen science has expanded far beyond that. And and um, 
there are opportunities through ERI to be engaged in some of this research uh, at the local level. So um, he's certainly uh, welcome if he's interested in urban uh, citizen science to, um, to reach out to me. Uh, but otherwise, there's other opportunities uh, to, um, uh, to engage on, on some local measurements. So I, 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 I love that. I like that we have uh, some, uh, some citizen science interest in this. Can you dig into that a little bit more and talk about what kinds of data citizens are collecting for your projects? Yeah, um, well, can I tell you about a super exciting project right now? Yeah. It's, it's spun off from the Grand Challenge. And as you know, the um, IU then issued a, a call for uh, uh, racial justice grants. So we've for a long time been measuring uh, the amount of people provide us with soil samples and we measure the amount of heavy metals in their soils from various areas. And, um, and that's all well and good, and it's informed a lot of local action. But um, we still have this problem of overburdened communities, right? They're overburdened with lead and underburdened with um, solutions for lead. So our, we applied for one of these uh, racial justice grants and got it to do something called uh, bookworms. A uh, great student of mine, John Shukla, uh, uh, conceived this. And bookworms is that we don't collect soil. We actually partner with schools, and kids collect earthworms after a rain. They shove them in this little bag with a little desiccant in them. We pick them up and we analyze them for heavy metals. It ends up earthworms are phenomenal little, uh, little uh, miners of the soil. And so they can tell us about regional, uh, regional environmental hazards. And, and the reason why it's called the book part is we're partnering with a Barnes and, regional Barnes and Noble to provide book certificates for the students who send in maybe 10 worms. I don't know, we haven't come up with the worm numbers. And, and uh, the fun part of that, about that project is really the only known intervention for, for lead poisoning, so early, early lead exposure, is educational interventions like reading. Uh, so uh, that's a project that I, I was so excited that the president offered this, this uh, the, the racial justice uh, program, or rather Fred K through Fred Kate's office. And it's an opportunity to partner with schools that are underserved, uh, mainly their African-American schools in urban settings. Um, Kids are gross. They love to pick up worms. You know, I I don't know what is it about them, but um, and then they get their information plus they get a book, and they don't even know that that's actually an intervention for for lead exposure. That's so cool. I love that. That's wonderful and very young citizen science scientist in that case. Um, Adam, you gave a thumbs up to that. I wonder if you is that the kind of um, uh, project that you that you can get involved with with your with educating for environmental change? Is that the kind of curriculum that you might share with teachers? It is. We know that that students learn better collaboratively. And if we have uh, a teacher in Indiana, for instance, that's doing uh, a science experiment on soil respiration, and then we have another teacher that's doing that same science experiment in California, uh, they can share data. And, they, and what's unique about that is they can do it both in person and online. So uh, there's lots of different ways that we can, we can uh, coordinate those efforts. And, and it just only improves the learning process for, for our students. So citizen science is a great thing for uh, students to get involved in, and it really uh, provides scientific foundations for them to understand climate change better as they move forward. Great. Um, Betsy, for those of us who haven't been able to see the, the show yet, um, I'm curious if there is a piece that speaks to you um, more powerfully than, than another, um, kind of in terms of communicating how, how Hoosiers um, uh, can, can think about environmental change and, um, and perhaps you know, influence our behavior. Mm -hmm. No, that's a great question. Um, I, uh, I look at exhibits as telling multiple stories about, about this theme. And um, to me, the most um, valuable uh, work of art, I believe, in the show is, is, a, is a video called Eclipse. And it's about the passenger pigeon. And um, I think it's important, though, to bring something from a video that's been made today about something that happened a long time ago uh, and connect that with the organism that is, is what that video is about. So what you're looking at, and I don't have an image of it today, so I'm sorry to say, but um, it's a video of, of a passenger pigeon. It's sort of a, um, uh, it sort of replicates the numbers of passenger pigeons that, were, that existed here. And then we, we actually borrowed a passenger pigeon um, um, specimen from the State Museum. So trying to pair those things 
um, by and telling a story about that this was an actual thing that existed and no longer exists. And this is how many there were. And now there are none, you know, just, I mean, really simple, basic, straightforward kind of, <laughs> kind of uh, illustration about, about uh, something that happened in Indiana's biodiversity um, years ago. So that to me is like the most effective way to, to always connect it to the organism or to connect it to the, to the real thing, um, I think is important. Like these, these uh, wolves behind me here um, are, you know, used to live in Indiana. Now they don't, and so we t we tell the story about why they don't live here anymore, and um, that's part of the exhibit as well. So that's a great, great, and uh, you know, that really entices me to to come see the show. I can't wait, Erin. Um, I think this is a question for you, and and maybe probably our last question. Um, it, it's a broad question, but I think because there's so much to be done in in cities and towns um, related to it, I'll direct it to you. Um, basically, what innovations do you think we need to reduce Indiana's carbon footprint? And how will those innovations affect the lives of Hoosiers? Well, I think that, you know, the innovations we need are, are innovations to the, the physical and, and human system components of our, of our uh, communities. Um, we need to have um, uh, people thinking and acting differently. But as, as Gabe mentioned, you know, uh, just just taking a few token steps to uh, to clean our recycling uh, material is not going to, you know, make a giant dent. Uh, we ha we have to change the physical infrastructure of our communities and rethink that. Rethink how we want to continue to pursue development. I mean, local governments, cities are growth machines. They are they are uh, uh, they are created and engineered to pursue economic development to pursue growth. Uh, and realigning uh, sort of growth with sustainability, you know, is is something that I think requires changes to how we, we think about both those two systems, the human system uh, and, and how we uh, pursue um, uh, developing human capital uh, and then the physical systems themselves, how we design uh, our, our physical gray and green infrastructure and, and try to make those work together uh, more more systematically. So thinking about it from a systems perspective. And that's going to encompass a lot of different innovations, right? There's going to be a lot of different types of innovation, technological innovation, managerial innovations that, that, that are going to be wrapped up in that or nested in it. Great, thank you. And before I turn it back over to Fred, I just have to say that this is proof that we're we're gonna miss Janet McCabe so much. She wrote in and said that when she has specific questions about recycling, she checks the indianarecycling.org website under the resources tab, you can find information about where you can recycle. And of course, Janet would have that answer right on the tip of her tongue, right? Um, so thank you, Janet, for that. And that speaks to the question that came up earlier. Um, Fred, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks for this opportunity. Super. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thanks to all of our participants today. I really appreciate uh, those of you on the screen for taking your time. But for those of you who aren't on the screen for taking your time and being part of this today, I want to thank Lisa Fakuda and Jonathan Hines who have worked to put this together. I'm very grateful for your efforts. If there are questions that didn't get answered, please send them to eri at iu.edu. That's the Environmental Resilience Institute, eri at iu.edu. We will get you answers to your questions. You might want to take a look at the website, eri.iu.edu. Thank you very much. Happy Earth Day. Take care. Bye-bye.